Operation Bodenplatte baseplate, launched on 1 January 1945, was an attempt by the Luftwaffe to cripple Allied air forces in the Low Countries during the Second World War. The goal of Bodenplatte was to gain air superiority during the stagnant stage of the Battle of the Bulge so that the German Army and Waffen-SS forces could resume their advance. The operation was planned for 16 December 1944, but was delayed repeatedly due to bad weather until New Year's Day, the first day that happened to be suitable. Secrecy for the operation was so tight that not all German ground and naval forces had been informed of the operation and some units suffered casualties from friendly fire. British Signals Intelligence Ultra recorded the movement and build-up of German air forces in the region, but did not realize that an operation was imminent. The operation achieved some surprise and tactical success, but was ultimately a failure. A great many Allied aircraft were destroyed on the ground but replaced within a week. Allied aircrew casualties were quite small, since the majority of Allied losses were grounded aircraft. The Germans, however, lost many pilots who could not be readily replaced. Post battle analysis suggests only 11 of the Luftwaffe's 34 air combat group and groups made attacks on time and with surprise. The operation failed to achieve air superiority, even temporarily, while the German ground forces continued to be exposed to Allied air attack. Bodenplatte was the last large-scale strategic offensive operation mounted by the Luftwaffe during the war. <laughs> <laughs> Background The armies of the Western Allies were supported by the Allied air forces as they advanced across Western Europe in 1944. The Royal Air Force RAF and its second tactical air force under the command of Air Marshal Arthur Coningham moved No. 2 Group RAF, No. 83 Group RAF, No. 84 Group RAF and No. 85 Group RAF to continental Europe in order to provide constant close air support. The RAF harassed the German air, sea and ground forces by hitting strong points and interdicting their supply lines while reconnaissance units apprised the Allies of German movements. With Allied air superiority, the German army could not operate effectively. The Luftwaffe, equally, found it difficult to provide effective air cover for the German army. Although German aircraft production peaked in 1944 the Luftwaffe was critically short of pilots and fuel, and lacked experienced combat leaders, the land battles moved towards the River Rhine, to the east of which lay the German heartland. Most of France had been liberated, as had the Belgian cities Brussels and Antwerp. Although Operation Market Garden had failed in 1944, by 1945 the Allies had overrun most of the southern Netherlands and the Scheldt estuary. As the ground forces moved across Europe, the Allied tactical air forces moved into new bases on the continent, to continue providing close support. The only limiting factor for the Allies was the weather. As winter came, the rains and mud turned airfields into quagmires, so large scale air and land operations came to a halt. The situation might well have continued until the spring thaw had the German High Command Oberkommando der Wehrmacht not launched the Battle of the Bulge on 16 December 1944. The land offensive was to improve the German military position by capturing Antwerp and separating the British Army from United States Army forces. Part of the planning for the German land operation required the attack to be conducted under the cover of bad winter weather, which kept the main Allied asset, the tactical air forces, on the ground. It initially succeeded, but the weather also grounded the Luftwaffe for the most part. Nevertheless, the Luftwaffe did manage to put 500 aircraft into the air on 16 December, more than had been achieved for a long time. This first day had been the originally planned date for the strike against Allied airfields, named Operation Bodenplatte. However, the weather proved particularly bad and operations were shut down, the offensive achieved surprise and much initial success. To counter the attack from the air, the United States Army Air Forces USAAF handed operational control of its 29 Tactical Air Command and part of its 9th Air Force, under the command of Major General Hoyt Vandenberg, to the RAF and Arthur Coningham. On 23 December, the RAF 2nd Tactical Air Force provided the American forces with much needed support, and helped prevent a German capture of Malmedy and Bastogne. This left the Germans with only the logistical bottleneck of St. Vith to support their operations. The German attack faltered, the Luftwaffe had been far from absent over the front in December. It flew several thousand sorties over the theater. Its encounters with the RAF and USAAF had meant heavy losses in materiel and pilots. 
On the eight days of operations between 17 and 27 December 1944, 644 fighters were lost and 227 damaged. This resulted in 322 pilots killed, 23 captured and 133 wounded. On the three days of operations 23 the 25th of December 363 fighters were destroyed. None of the Geschwaderkommodoren expected any large-scale air operations by the end of the month. Topic. Plan In September 1944, Adolf Hitler resolved to recover Germany's deteriorating fortunes by launching an offensive in the West. On 16 September, Hitler directed Generalleutnant Werner Kreipa chief of the general staff to prepare the necessary aircraft for the offensive. On 21 October, Kreipa ordered the air fleet defending the Greater German Reich to hand over seven Jagdgeschwader and Schlachtgeschwader to Air Command West for a future offensive. On 14 November, Hermann Göring commander in chief of the Luftwaffe ordered the two Jagdivision and the three Jagdivision to prepare their units for a large scale ground attack operation in the Ardennes. Preparations were to be complete by 27 November. The attack was to be carried out on the first day of the offensive. General Mahor Dietrich Peltz was to plan the operation having been appointed C in C of 2. Fliegerkorps on 8 December. Luftwaffenkommando West had ordered all units except Jagdgeschwader 300 and 301 to attend the main planning meeting in Flammersfeld on 5 December. On 14 December, Peltz officially initiated plans for a major blow against the Allies in northwest Europe. Peltz was not a fighter pilot, his combat record was as a dive bomber pilot, flying the Junkers Ju 87 Stuka. His experiences in Poland, in France, and during the early campaigns on the Eastern Front had molded him into an outstanding ground attack specialist, making him an ideal candidate for planning Bodenplatte. On 15 December, this plan was worked out with the help of the Luftwaffe's JAGD Geschwaderkommodore, among them Gothard Hendrik, Jagdabschnitzfuhrer Mittelrhein, Fighter Sector Leader Mittelrhein, Walter Grabman and Karl Henschel, commanders of 3 and 5. Jag Division, respectively. It was originally scheduled to support the Battle of the Bulge, the German Army's offensive, which began 16 December 1944. However, the same bad weather that prevented the RAF and USAAF from supporting their own ground forces also prevented the Luftwaffe from carrying out the operation. It was therefore not launched until 1 January 1945. By this time, the German army had lost momentum owing to Allied resistance and clearing weather, which allowed Allied air forces to operate. The German army attempted to restart the attack by launching Operation Nordwind, Unternehmen Nordwind. The Luftwaffe was to support this offensive through Bodenplatte. The plan of Bodenplatte called for a surprise attack against 16 Allied air bases in Belgium, the Netherlands and France. The object was to destroy or cripple as many Allied aircraft, hangars and airstrips as possible. Every fighter and fighter-bomber Geschwader wing currently occupied with air defense along the Western Front was redeployed. Additional night fighter units and medium bomber units acted as pathfinders. The strike formations themselves were mostly single-engine Messerschmitt Bf 109 and Focke Wolf Fw 190 fighters, however, in a blunder, the planners had set flight paths that took many units over some of the most heavily defended areas on the continent, namely the V-2 launch sites around The Hague. These sites were protected by large numbers of German anti-aircraft artillery AAA units. At the turn of 1944-45 Air Command West had 267 heavy and 277 medium or light AAA batteries, and in addition to this there were 100 Kriegsmarine AAA batteries along the Dutch coast. Most of these lay in the sector of the 16th AAA Division, with its control station at Dodingcham, 15 miles 24 kilometers northeast of Arnhem. Some of the AAA units been warned about the air operation but were not kept up to date with developments about changing timetables and the flight plan of German formations. As a result, one quarter of the German fighter units lost aircraft to friendly fire before the attacks could be initiated. After five years of war and heavy attrition many of the Luftwaffe's pilots were inexperienced and poorly trained, deficient in marksmanship and flight skills. There was a shortage of experienced instructors, and many of the training units were forced to fly frontline operations in order to bolster the frontline Jagdgeschwader. 
Aviation fuel supplies were also at a premium, limiting the duration of training. Long-range Allied fighters exacerbated this situation by shooting down many training aircraft. By late 1944 there were no safe areas in which pilots could be trained without the possibility of air attack. The result was a vicious circle. Poorly trained pilots were quickly lost in combat or accidents, and the need to replace them put more pressure on the training system. Allied personnel who witnessed the attacks remarked on the poor aim of the strafing aircraft, and many of the Luftwaffe aircraft shot down by Allied anti-aircraft fire were caught because they were flying too slowly and too high. The plan called for strict radio silence and secrecy in order to maintain surprise. Maps were also only half complete, identified only enemy installations, and left out flight paths, lest the document fall into Allied hands enabling them to trace the whereabouts of German fighter bases. Most commanders were also refused permission to brief their pilots until moments before takeoff. This created operational confusion. Commanders got across only the bare essentials of the plan. When the operation got underway, many German pilots still did not understand what the operation was about, or what exactly was required of them. They were convinced it was just a reconnaissance in force over the front, and were happy to follow their flight leaders on this basis. Topic. Targets and order of battle It is unclear whether all of the following were deliberately targeted. Evidence suggests that Grimbergen, Nock and Afoven were targeted in error, as was Heesch. In all, the Oberkommando der Luftwaffe OKL deployed 1,035 aircraft from several Jagdgeschwader JG, fighter wings Kampfgeschwader KG, bomber wings, Nachtjagdgeschwader NJG, night fighter wings and Schlachtgeschwader SG, Ground attack wings, of these, 38.5% were BF 109s, 38.5% FW 190s, and 23% FW 190Ds. Below is the German target list. Codenames Following the Operation Bodenplatte raids, the Allies retrieved several log books from crashed German aircraft. In several of these, the entry, Auftrag Hermann 1.1, 1 .1, 1945, Zeit, 9.20 Uhr, was translated as, Operation Hermann to commence on 1 January 1945, at 9.20 am. This led the Allies to believe the operation itself was named Hermann for Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring. Five further different codes were used for the attack. Varus, indicating that the operation was, a go and that it would take place within 24 hours of the Varus order being given. Teutonicus, authority to brief the pilots and to arrange for the aircraft to be armed and ready at the edge of the airfield. Hermann, giving the exact date and time of the attack. Dorothea, indicating a delay in the attack. Spotleys, cancelling of the attack after formations are airborne. Topic. Allied intelligence. Allied intelligence failed to detect the German intention. In ultra transcripts, there are only a few indications of what was happening on the other side of the front. On 4 December 1944, two Jagd Corps had ordered stockpiling for navigational aids, such as golden rain, flares and smoke bombs. Allied intelligence made no written observations of this communication. They also disregarded communications to Junkers Ju-88 groups regarding the use of flares when leading formations. Intelligence concluded that these instructions were designed for a ground support mission rather than an interception operation. This was reasonable, but no indications of possible ground targets were given. On 20 December, a 3. Jaj Division message was intercepted confirming that the locations for emergency landing grounds during a special undertaking had remained unchanged. This was a clear indication that something was amiss, but Allied intelligence did not comment on it. It also ignored more messages indicating that low-level attacks were being practiced. Allied intelligence, by 16 December, had monitored the reshuffling of both German Army and Luftwaffe formations opposite the American-held front at the Ardennes. Yet nothing major was suspected. Topic. Battle Topic. Maldegem, Ursel and St. Denis Westrom 
Jajdeshwader JG-1 was responsible for the attack on the Ursel and Maldijem airfields. Oberseleutnant Herbert Illefeld led the Geschwader. The formation was mixed, stab, headquarters flight or stabeschwarm, attached to every Geschwader, I and II, JG-1 operated the FW-190 while the three JG-1 flew the BF-109. I, JG-1 lost four of their number to friendly anti-aircraft fire. Three of the four pilots were killed. The attacks at Maldijem and Ursel began at 8.30. Both I and II, JG-1 became involved in intense dogfights. Three, JG-1 had lost only one aircraft over the target and not to enemy fire. I, JG lost a further FW-190 to friendly anti-aircraft fire as it made its way to Ursel. Three, JG-1 lost at least two further FW-190s to friendly anti-aircraft fire. Casualties could have been heavier, had the British anti-aircraft defences of Maldijem airfield not been moved in December, STAB, and I, JG-1 lost 13 FW-190s and 9 pilots were missing, 5 were killed and 4 were captured. Thus the loss rates in personnel and materiel were 39 and 56 percent, respectively. 3. JG-1 lost only 3 BF-109s with 1 pilot dead and 2 captured. I, JG-1 claimed 30 British Spitfires on the ground and two shot down over Maldijem. At Maldijem, 16 aircraft were destroyed, and at Ursel only six were lost. The claims of I, JG-1 were actually more in line with British total losses at both Maldijem and Ursel. Number 131 Wing RAF, Polish Wing lost 13 Spitfires plus two damaged beyond repair, a total of 15 lost. At Ursel, six aircraft were destroyed, including, a B-17, two Lancasters and a Mosquito. I, and three, JG-1 lost a total of 16 aircraft and 12 pilots. Not a good return. Two, JG-1 attacked the airfield at St. Denis Westrom. Of the 36 two, JG-1 FW-190s that took off, 17 were shot down, a staggering 47% loss rate. Among the pilots lost were several experienced flyers. In exchange, the Germans shot down two Spitfires, and seven forced landed. At St. Denis 18 Spitfires were destroyed on the ground, altogether JG-1 lost 25 pilots and 29 aircraft. This return for around 60 enemy aircraft 54 on the ground cannot be considered a complete success, although the damage at St. Denis Westrom and Maldijem had been significant. Just nine of the fighters lost by JG-1 air confirmed to have been shot down in combat with Spitfires. It is possible a further three were shot down by Spitfires, or perhaps ground fire. Two Spitfires were shot down and destroyed, with two more damaged. One pilot of each squadron 308 and 317 was killed. The total Spitfire losses were perhaps 32. St. Truiden Schlachtgeschwader 4 and Jajdeschwader 2 SG4 and JG2 were to strike at St. Truiden airfield. JG2 was commanded by Kurt Bulligen. I, JG2's ground crews made ready 35 of 46 FW-190s, 29 of which were FW-190D. Only 33 pilots were fit for operations. So the group reported only 33 FW-190s ready. 2. JG-2 could field 20 of 29 BF-109s. Stab, JG-2 had three FW-190s ready for the mission. It is not clear whether Bulligen took part in the mission. 3. JG-2 reported 40 FW-190s operational, 34 of them FW-190Ds. However, only 28 of the 43 pilots in the unit were fit for operations and the formation fielded only 28 fighters. In total, 84 aircraft were ready on 31 December, including 28 FW-190D-9s. SG-4 was led by Alfred Druschel. It had 152 machines on strength, of which just 60 were operational, yet the 129 pilots were fit for action. STAB, SG-4 had three FW-190s and two pilots. I, SG-4 had 21 FW-190s operational and 27 pilots ready. 2. SG reported 27 FW-190s ready, but pilot strength is unknown. 3. SG reported 24 FW-190s, but only 16 were available at the forward airfields. Pilot strength is unknown. 
Best estimations make it around 60 FW-190s operational, of which 55 took part. At 9:12, JG-2 crossed the front line at Malmedy and was greeted by an enormous volume of Allied ground fire. The entire area was heavily defended by anti-aircraft artillery, since the area had been the scene of heavy fighting, but also had been attacked by V-1 and V-2 missiles. I, JG-2 lost at least seven fighters to ground fire alone. 3. JG-2 lost 10 fighters. A possible 7 BF-109s from 2. JG-2 were also lost to ground fire. JG-2 attacked Ash and Afovan airfields by mistake. JG-2's mission was a disaster. I. JG-2 lost 18 FW-190s and 6 more were damaged by ground fire and enemy aircraft. This represented 73% of their force. Of the 15 pilots missing, six would survive as POWs. 2. JG-2 lost 5 BF-109s and 3 were damaged a loss rate of 40%. Pilot losses were 3 missing, 1 dead and 1 wounded. 3. JG-2 lost 19 FW-190s and 3 were damaged, a loss rate of 79%. 9 pilots were killed, 2 were wounded and 4 were captured. JG-2 losses, according to another source, amounted to 40% of its force. Pilot losses were 24 killed or posted missing, 10 captured and 4 wounded. Another source asserts that pilot losses stood at 23 killed or missing. SG FA's mission was also a disaster. During the assembly phase, they flew across JG-11's flight path, and the formation was broken up. Some of the pilots joined JG-11 in the confusion. Unable to recover the formation, I and 2, SG-4 then decided to head home. The Commodore, Druschel, had continued with five other pilots from 3, SG-4 who had lost contact with their group. They crossed the front near Hertgenwald around 9.10. As they did so, American anti-aircraft batteries opened fire, claiming seven aircraft in the next 30 minutes. Only six of the 50 FW-190s of SG-4 carried out an attack, against airfields near Aachen and the Ash Aerodrome. Of these six, four did not return. Druschel himself was reported missing. Valkyl and Heesh The target of Jajdeshwader 6 JG6 was Valkyl. I and 3, JG6 were to attack while 2, JG6 was to provide cover against Allied fighters. I, JG-6 got 29 of its 34 FW-190s ready, while 25 of 2, JG-6 of fighters took part. Overall, most of the 99 FW-190s were made available for the operation. 3, JG-6 received orders to target petrol installations on the airfield only. Only 78 FW-190s took off, while on course, JG-6 approached the airfield of Heesh and some of its pilots assumed it to be Valkyl airfield. It is unlikely that the Heesh strip, built in October 1944, was known to the Luftwaffe. Number 126 Wing RCAF was based there and had dispatched its 411 and 442 squadrons on recce missions early that morning so the majority of its units were airborne. Its 401 squadron was readying for takeoff when JG-6 appeared at 915. Most of the German pilots had failed to notice the airfield, concentrating on keeping formation at low altitude. 401 squadron scrambled. Some of the German fighters were authorized to engage, while the main body continued to search for Valkyl. Stab, and 2, JG-6 stumbled on another strip at Helmand, which contained no aircraft. Several German pilots believed it to be Valkyl and attacked, losing several of their number to ground fire. 2, JG-6 suffered severely from Spitfire and Tempests based at Helmand. Very little damage was done at Heesh or Helmand. In the event, all four Gruppen failed to find Valkyl and its Hawker Tempests remained untouched. The only success JG-6 had was I. JG's erroneous attack on Eindhoven, which claimed 33 fighters and six medium bombers. Like Valkyl, Helmand and Heesh had escaped damage. In the dogfights over Helmand, JG-6 claimed six victories. In fact, only two Spitfires were shot down and one badly damaged. Only one further fighter, a Hawker Typhoon, was shot down. Stab, JG-6 lost the Commodore, Kogler, as a POW. 
Of I, JG's 29 FW190s, seven were lost and two damaged, of two, JG6 A25 FW190s, eight were destroyed and two damaged, three, JG6 lost 12 out 20 BF109s. In total, JG6 lost 43% of its strength and suffered 16 pilots killed or missing and seven captured. As well as Kogler, one other commanding officer was lost. Gruppenkommandor Helmut Kuhl. Three Staffelkapitän were lost, Hauptmann Ewald Trost was captured, Hauptmann Norbert Katz was killed and Lothar Gerlach was posted missing presumed killed. Topic. Antwerp Dern and Wohnsdrecht Dern airfield was to be destroyed by Jagdgeschwader 77, JG 77 Antwerp housed the largest Allied contingent of nine squadrons. It had been incessantly attacked by V-1 cruise missiles and V-2 SRBM ballistic missiles, and had been given a strong anti-aircraft defense. At 8 o'clock, two formations 18 BF 109s of I and 3, JG-77, led by Major Siegfried Freitag, took off with their pathfinders. At the same time 23 BF 109s of 2, JG-77 took off. Around the Bacholt area they formed up with the other two Gruppen. Heading south and still north of Antwerp, JG-77 passed Wohnsdrecht airfield. It was home to No. 132 Wing RAF and its five Spitfire squadrons, No. 331 Squadron RAF, No. 332 Squadron RAF Norwegian, No. 66 Squadron RAF and No. 127 Squadron RAF, and No. 322 Squadron RAF Dutch. Some pilots from 2, JG-77 either mistakenly believed it to be Antwerp, or thought the opportunity was too good to pass up. Two German fighters were claimed shot down, and one pilot captured. However, none of the JG-77 casualties fit this description, the main body continued to Antwerp. Some 12 to 30 German fighters attacked the airfield from 9.25 to 9.40. The ground defenses were alert and the German formations attacked in a disorganized manner. 145 wing RAF was missed completely and considering the large number of targets the destruction was light, just 12 Spitfires were destroyed, in total, 14 Allied aircraft were destroyed and 9 damaged. JG-77 lost 11 BF-109s and their pilots were lost. 6 were killed and 5 captured according to Allied sources. However, German records show the loss of only 10 pilots. 4 are listed as captured. Topic. Metz Frescati Jagdgeschwader 53, JG 53 was tasked with the operation against the USAAF airfield at Metz Frescati Air Base. STAB, 2, 3, and IV, JG 53 were available. 3, JG 53 was to destroy anti aircraft installations in the Metz area, while the other group and knocked out the airfields. The USAAF 19 Tactical Air Command had established a strong presence in northeast France and was supporting the U.S. Third Army. JG 53 was to knock out its airfields. Some 26 BF 109s took off but were intercepted by 12 P 47s of the 367th Fighter Squadron, 358th Fighter Group. The P-47s claimed 13 destroyed, 1 probable and 6 damaged for no losses. On the way home at 9.20, 3, JG-53 were intercepted by 366th Fighter Squadron. Altogether, 3, JG-53 lost 10 BF-109s and 1 damage to the 358th Fighter Group. Of the 25-3, JG-53 BF-109s that took part, 11 were shot down representing 40% of the attacking force. The 358th Fighter Group received the Distinguished Unit Citation for preventing the attack on the 362nd Fighter Group's airfield, although 3, JG-53 failed, the main attack was a success by comparison. STAB. 2, and IV, JG-53 encountered no difficulties on the outward leg. The Germans caused significant damage among the parked USAAF fighters on the field. When the attack against the Metz airfield was over, the three JG-53 Gruppen reported the loss of 20 BF-109s and 7 damaged. This represented more than 50% of the attacking 52 fighters. Some 13 pilots were missing, 3 were killed, 6 remain missing as of today, and 4 were captured. A further 3 were wounded. 
JG-53 claimed 27 USAAF fighters on the ground and 8 damaged. Added to this total is 4 aerial victories. In total JG-53 lost 30 BF-109s and 8 damaged in the two operations. This was a total loss of 48%. The losses of the USAAF were 22 destroyed, 11 damaged all P-47 TS. However, the negative effects of Bodenplatte on JG-53 outweighed any advantages gained. Le Coulot and Afoven Le Coulot Airfield later known as Bovichain, was 45 km 28 miles northeast of Charleroi and was the target of Jajdeschwader 4 JG4. The main strip A89 was known locally as Bovichain, and an auxiliary field known as Le Coulot East Y10, known to the locals as Barretts, was nearby. It was known to the Luftwaffe because several of its units had operated there. Geschwaderkommandor Major Gerhard Michalski commanded the force. Five pilots were shot down by ground fire. Another pilot got lost during the flight and ended up near Eindhoven where he was shot down and killed. Reduced in number, 8-10 fighters of IV, JG-4 continued to their target. After 10 minutes, they located a fairly large airfield and attacked, believing it to be Le Coulot. It was in fact St. Truiden, the mistake was easy to make, Le Coulot was located nearby. St. Truiden housed the 48th Fighter Group and 404th Fighter Group. The 492nd Fighter Squadron was readying to take off at 9.20. JG-4 hit the airfield at 9.15. Several P-47s taxiing out were abandoned by pilots and strafed to destruction. The small-scale attack by JG had achieved considerable damage. Total American losses were 10 destroyed and 31 damaged. The Germans lost 8 fighters, including 7 BF-109s, and 3 damaged. No damage was done at Le Coulot airfield. 2. Sturm, JG-4 took off for Le Coulot at 8.08. Getting lost, they stumbled upon Ash Airfield and claimed one P-47 destroyed and two twin-engine aircraft damaged, as well as two trains and trucks destroyed. The unit claimed an Oster reconnaissance aircraft shot down. The machine was probably a Stinson L-1 vigilant of the 125th Liaison Squadron, U.S. Army. However, virtually the entire group of 17 FW-190s was wiped out, I, and 3, JG-4 were to strike Le Coulot together. Taking off at 8.20 and heading northwest, they comprised a force of 35 BF-109s 9 from 3, JG-4. 2 Ju-88G-1s of 2, NJG-101 lead as pathfinders. Some of I, JG-4 attacked No. 125 wing RAF Spitfires at a Foven airfield. Spitfire losses are unclear. Two P-47s and a B-17 were destroyed. I, JG-4 reported two BF-109s missing, one damaged and one destroyed. Just a hangar, one P-47 and several vehicles were claimed, and the anti-aircraft battery was silenced. The attack on the Spitfires at Afoven and the mentioned B-17 and two P-47s are not included in the total. Another source suggests two Spitfires destroyed and ten damaged at Afoven. According to one source, JG FA's losses were 25 fighters of the 55 that took part. With 17 pilots killed or missing and seven captured, JG 4 suffered a 42% loss rate. A more recent source claims a total of 75 aircraft of JG 4 took part, with only 12 attacking ground targets. Two Ju-88 Pathfinders were lost, as well as 26 fighters with six more damaged. Topic. Ash The Ash airfield had been constructed in November 1944 and was home to the 352nd Fighter Group, 8th Air Force, and the 366th Fighter Group, 9th Air Force. Jajdeschwader 11 JG-11 was to destroy the airfield. I, JG-11 had only 16 FW-190s on strength and only 6 fit and operational pilots. Only 6 of I, JG-1's pilots took part, and just 4 of STAB, JG-1's pilots participated. 3, JG-11 had more aircraft than pilots, and so other staffel made up the numbers. Just 41 FW-190s of JG-11 took part in Bodenplatte, 4 from the STAB, 6 from I group and 31 of 3 group. The 20 fighters from 2. 
Group were BF-109s, the plan called for a low-level strike by IN-3, JG-11, while two, JG-11 flew as top cover against USAAF fighters. The pilots were shown maps and photographs of the airfield, but were not told the target's identity until the morning of the attack. After crossing Allied lines, four fighters were lost to AAA fire. The course of JG-11 took it directly over a Foven. Large formations of JG-11 attacked, in the mistaken belief it was ash. The other half continued to ash. A Foven housed No. 125 Wing RAF, just 5 kilometers 3.1 miles north of ash. About half, or some 30 FW-190s and BF-109s attacked the airfield, ash was notable for a chance event. The 390th Squadron of the 366th Fighter Group had launched two fighter sweeps that morning, which played a crucial role in the failure of JG-11's attack. The leader of the 487th Squadron, 352nd Fighter Group, John Charles Meyer, anticipated German activity and had a flight of 12 P-51s about to take off on a combat patrol when the attack began. They took off under fire, several pilots made ace status that day. No P-51s were lost, two were damaged and one was damaged on the ground. The 336th Fighter Group lost one P-47. The 366th was credited with eight enemy aircraft, and AAA claimed seven more. However, overclaiming is likely. Luftwaffe records indicate JG-11 lost 28 fighters. Four German pilots two wounded made it back to German-held territory, while four were captured and the remaining 20 were killed. Some 24 of the BF-109s and FW-190s lost were lost over enemy lines. German ace Gunther Specht was among those German pilots killed, little is known about the claims of JG-11. According to one German document, 13 fighters, two twin-engine and one four-engine aircraft were claimed destroyed. Five fighters were claimed damaged on Glabeek airfield. In reality it was a Foven. Ten aerial victories and one probable were also claimed. But U.S. fighter group losses indicate these claims are excessive. The Americans claimed 35 German aircraft destroyed. Only 14 can be judged with a degree of certainty to have been shot down by USAAF fighters, and possibly two more. Four are confirmed to have been shot down by AAA fire. Total JG-11 losses were 28. The air battle over Ash had lasted 45 minutes. Topic. Brussels Everett, Grimbergen Jajdeschwader 26 JG26 and the three group of Jajdeschwader 54 JG54 were to strike at Brussels Everett. At the end of December, two JG26 had 39 D-9s and three JG26 had 45 BF109s. Records of available aircraft indicate 110 aircraft of JG-26 flew that day, all but 29 were FW-190s, the remainder were BF-109s, 17 FW-190s from 3, JG-54 took part with JG-26, unknown to the Luftwaffe the Grimbergen airfield was almost completely abandoned. The Everay airfield was located to the south. It was one of the most densely populated airfields in Belgium and had plenty of targets. The main force consisted of 60 Spitfire XVIs of No. 127 Wing RAF. Also present were B-17s and B-24s of the 8th Air Force. Overall, well over 100 aircraft were on the field. At 8.13, the first formations took off. In total, 64 FW-190D-9s participated. Before the target was reached, some 14 D-9s were forced to turn back due to AAA damage or mechanical difficulties. Three FW-190s were lost to German AAA fire. At 9.10, when the front was reached, Allied heavy AAA units began to engage the formation and another five were shot down. Most of the fire was from British naval AAA defences defending the Schult estuary. As the formation crossed the Dutch and Belgian border, I, JG-26 and 3, JG-54 were intercepted by Spitfires. Five of the FW-190s were shot down. I, JG-26 destroyed or damaged the few aircraft at the airfield. AAA defences claimed five kills and I, JG-26 reported two FW-190s lost to Spitfires. Several others were lost over the airfield. Other losses occurred against friendly fire again on the return flight, the raid was a disaster. 
Just six machines were destroyed at Grimbergen for the loss of 21 FW-190s and two damaged. Another eight sustained minor damage. Some 17 pilots were missing, eight of whom would survive as prisoners, only two, and three, JG-26 hit Everay. Between 44 and 52 FW-190s from these units took off. Two, and three, JG-26 knocked out the flak towers and destroyed anything combustible, hangars, trucks, fuel dumps and aircraft. 127 wing RCAF lost one Spitfire in the air and 11 on the ground, 11 vehicles were damaged and one was destroyed. A total of 60-61 Allied aircraft were destroyed at Everay. A large number of transports were located there and attracted the attention of German pilots, which left many more Spitfires undamaged. Given the number of Spitfires on the field, the Canadian wing suffered low losses. The Canadian wing commander, Johnny Johnson blamed the poor marksmanship of German pilots for failing to achieve further success. Allied losses are given at Everay as 32 fighters, 22 twin engine aircraft, and 13 four engine aircraft destroyed, plus another nine single, six twin, and one four engine aircraft damaged. In total, two JG 26 losses included 13 FW 190s destroyed and two damaged. Nine of its pilots were missing, five were killed, and four captured. 3. JG-26 lost 6 BF-109s and 4 pilots. Only one of them was captured, the remainder were killed. The amount of damage the Germans inflicted made up for the losses, the Everay strike was a success. <laughs> brussels melsbrook Jajdeschwader 27 and IV, Jajdeschwader 54, JG 27 and JG 54 targeted Melsbrook airfield. On 31 December, JG 27 could only muster the following operational pilots and aircraft, 22, 22 from I, 19 13 from 2 13 15 from 3, and 16 17 from IV. Group. Geschwaderkommodore Wolfgang Spate had rebuilt IV, JG 54. It had only 21 pilots and 15 of its 23 FW-190s were operational. Altogether 28 BF-109s of JG-27 and 15 FW-190s of JG-54 took off. Seven fighters were lost to enemy aircraft and friendly AAA fire before they reached the target. The Germans hit Melsbrook hard. According to Emil Clade, leading three, JG-27, the AAA positions were not manned, and aircraft were bunched together or in lines, which made perfect targets. The attack caused considerable damage among the units based there and was a great success. The recce wings had lost two entire squadrons worth of machines. No. 69 Squadron RAF lost 11 Vickers Wellingtons and two damaged. No. 140 Squadron RAF lost four Mosquitoes, the losses being made good the same day. At least five Spitfires from No. 16 Squadron RAF were destroyed. No. 271 Squadron RAF lost at least seven Harrow transports. Out of action. A further 15 other aircraft were destroyed. 139 Wing reported five B-25s destroyed and five damaged. Some 15 to 20 USAAF bombers were also destroyed. Another source states that 13 Wellingtons were destroyed, as were 5 Mosquitoes, 4 Oster and 5 Avro Ansons from the Tactical Air Force's 2nd Communications Squadron. Three Spitfires were also lost and two damaged. At least one RAF Transport Command Douglas Dakota was destroyed, the pilots of JG-27 and 54 claimed 85 victories and 40 damaged. German reconnaissance was able to confirm 49. JG-27 suffered unacceptable losses, 17 BF-109s, 11 pilots killed, 1 wounded and 3 captured. IV, JG-54 lost 2 killed and 1 captured. 3 FW-190s were lost and 1 damaged. <laughs> Gilsey Ridgen and Eindhoven Jajdeschwader 3, JG3, and Kampfgeschwader 51, KG51, were tasked with eliminating the Allied units at the Eindhoven base and Gilsey Ridgen airfield. The field contained three Spitfire squadrons and eight Typhoon units of the RAF and RCAF. Some 22 BF109s of I JG3 took off along with four from Stab JG3, 15 from 3, JG3, and 19 FW190s from IV JG3. 
KG-51 contributed some 21 of their 30 Messerschmitt Mi-262 jets to the action. Some histories mistakenly include Kampfgeschwader 76 KG-76 on the order of battle, but KG-76 did not take part in the mission, each staffel was expected to make at least three firing passes. I, JG-3 took off and joined the lead group, IV Sturm, JG-3, with three. JG-3 following in the rear. The BF-109s and FW-190s of the Geschwader reached the area at about 9.20. Geschwaderkommodor Heinrich Barr led the attack. Some pilots made four passes, destroying AAA emplacements, fuel storage stations and vehicles. Nearly 300 aircraft were on the field, along with huge stores of equipment and fuel. The attack caused fires all over the airfield, JG-3 claimed 53 single-engine and 11 twin-engine aircraft destroyed. Five fighters and one four-engine bomber were also claimed damaged. Four Typhoons, three Spitfires, one Tempest and another unidentified aircraft were claimed shot down. All in all, JG-3 destroyed 43 aircraft according to British records, and damage a further 60, some seriously. The Geschwader believed it had destroyed 116. JG-3 did not come away unscathed. I, JG-3 lost nine of its aircraft and pilots, a 50% loss rate. Damage to the returning group aircraft meant the entire unit was unserviceable. RAF AAA were credited with shooting down five. JG-3 lost, altogether, 15 of the 60 fighters sent, a 25% loss rate. Some 15 pilots were missing, nine were killed and five captured, and another pilot was posting as missing in action and his fate remains unknown. Another source says 16 pilots, 10 killed or missing and 6 captured. The damage done to Eindhoven was significant and can be considered a victory for JG-3. It was also assisted by elements of JG-6 which had misidentified Eindhoven as one their targets. The greatest losses were amongst the Recce Wing and the Canadian 124 Wing RCAF, which suffered 24 aircraft destroyed or damaged. The visiting 39-wing RAF lost 30 aircraft destroyed or damaged. 143-wing RCAF lost 29 damaged or destroyed. It is likely that I, JG-3 was responsible for about two-thirds of the damage. Another source gives 47 aircraft destroyed and 43 damaged. Topic. Possible V-2 missile launch attempts At least one V-2 missile on a mobile Meyerwagen launch trailer was observed being elevated to launch position by a USAAF 4th Fighter Group pilot over the northern German attack route near the town of Lokem on 1 January 1945. Possibly on account of the launch crew sighting the American fighter, the rocket was quickly lowered from a near launch ready 85 degrees elevation to 30 degrees. Topic. Results of raid. The results of the raid are difficult to judge given the confusion over loss records. It is likely more aircraft were destroyed than listed. The Americans failed to keep a proper record of their losses and it appears the U.S. 8th Air Force losses were not included in loss totals. When these estimates and figures are added to the losses listed in the table below, it is likely that the correct figures are 232 destroyed 143 single engine, 74 twin engine and 15 four engine and 156 damaged 139 single engine, 12 twin engine and 5 four engine. Researching individual squadron records confirms the destruction of even more USAAF aircraft. This suggests at least a further 16 B-17s, 14 B-24s, 8 P-51s, and at least 2 P-47s were destroyed on top of that total. A total of 290 destroyed and 180 damaged seems a more realistic summation than the conservative figures given by the USAAF, RAF, and RCAF. Including the 15 Allied aircraft shot down and 10 damaged in aerial combat, 305 destroyed and 190 damaged as the sum total of the attack. The results of the attacks are listed little to no damage, light damage, medium damage, heavy damage. Topic. Aftermath and casualties The operation achieved tactical surprise, but it was undone by poor execution due to low pilot skill resulting from poor training. The operation failed to achieve its aim and that failure was very costly to German air power. 
Some of the units of the RAF, RCAF and USAAF on the receiving end of Bodenplatte had been badly hit, others not so badly, but most had sustained some losses. The Germans, however, launched Bodenplatte under a set of conditions, such as poor planning and low pilot skill, which clearly indicated any advantage gained would be outweighed by possible losses. Bodenplatte weakened the Jagdwaffe past any hope of rebuilding. General der Jagdflieger Adolf Galland said, We sacrificed our last substance. The Luftwaffe lost 143 pilots killed and missing, while 70 were captured and 21 wounded, including three Geschwaderkommandor, five Gruppenkommandor, and 14 Staffelkapitän the largest single day loss for the Luftwaffe. Many of the formation leaders lost were experienced veterans, which placed even more pressure on those who were left. Thus, Bodenplatte was a very short-term success but a long-term failure. Allied losses were soon made up, while lost Luftwaffe aircraft and especially pilots were irreplaceable. German historian Gerhard Weinberg wrote that it left the Germans weaker than ever and incapable of mounting any major attack again. In the remaining 17 weeks of war the Jagdwaffe struggled to recover sufficiently from the 1 January operation to remain an effective force. In strategic terms, German historian Werner Gerbig wrote, Operation Bodenplatte amounted to a total defeat. The exhausted German units were no longer able to mount an effective defense of German air space during Operation Plunder and Operation Varsity, the Allied crossing of the Rhine River, or the overall Western Allied invasion of Germany. Subsequent operations were insignificant as a whole, and could not challenge Allied air supremacy. The only service in the Luftwaffe capable of profitable sorties was the night fighter force. In the last six weeks of the war the Luftwaffe was to lose another 200 pilots killed. Gerbig wrote, It was not until the autumn of 1944 that the German fighter forces set foot down the sacrificial path, and it was the controversial Operation Bodenplatte that dealt this force a mortal blow and sealed its fate. What happened from then on was no more than a dying flicker. Notes. Topic References Topic Citations Topic Bibliography Topic External Links Squadron Log the first of January nineteen forty five Operation Strength of JG one at the time of Unternehmen Bodenplatte to Win the Winter Sky by Danny S. Parker